Well, with a blizzard bearing down on West Texas, uh, Jason and I thought we'd go ahead and get ahead of the game and cancel the 10 a.m. service for Sunday, December 27th. And silly me, uh, I interpreted that as now I don't have to preach on that day. However, uh, Jason had an idea of videotaping the message and putting that online. And so here I am on a Saturday morning uh, videotaping uh, the sermon that would have been uh, shared with you tomorrow morning. I'm actually happy to do it. Uh, so thank you, Jason, for the idea. Thank you, Chris Gescheidel, for coming up and helping me with the, the videotape. And Jared Hatchett for uploading that for us. Uh, just a couple of uh, announcements uh, before we get into the, the abbreviated sermon. Uh, if you were going to make a year-end contribution on Sunday, December 27th, you can still do that. Just remember that you can mail that into our office as long as it's postmarked by December 31st. You can still bring that into the office as long as you're here before noon on December 31st. The office will close at noon on that day. But you can also give online. So if you go to BaconHeights.com under the Resources tab, uh, there is a, a choice there for Give Online. And you can also do that. It's very easy. Uh, that's the way I now do all my giving. So I would encourage you to look at that. <clears throat> Quickly, a report on the Christmas Eve service here at Bacon Heights. Um, for my family, Christmas Eve has become a very important part of our family tradition and, and probably for many of you as well. This year uh, it was a little bit different. It, it was not what you have come to expect. I knew it would be different going into it, um, but I would contend that it was better uh, than it's ever been this year. The reason for that, uh, Jason Ashley, our lead pastor, and uh, Tiny Dominguez, lead pastor of Community Heights Church here in the 414 um, zip code, uh, met and decided to have a joint Christmas Eve service. And it was, it was great. I just wanted to report that these two churches came together to worship the Lord, celebrate the birth of our Savior, and it was awesome. I had a great time. It was probably a highlight of my Christmas season. Um, I looked out across the worship center, and what I saw, I, I saw several different cultures worshiping together. Uh, I saw a wide range of ages. I, I saw a wide range of socioeconomic status. Um, it must have been very pleasing in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. So if you hear about these partnerships in the future between Bacon Heights and Community Heights, plan to be a part of that. I believe that through those partnerships uh, in those those times when we can work together, 414 and our city can be impacted greatly. So be a part of anything that is Community Heights and Bacon Heights working together. Well, I will, uh, as I said earlier, give you an abbreviated version of the sermon that you would have heard on Sunday, December 27th. Uh, you can watch that in the comfort of your home. You can use that with your domestic church if you all choose to. You can look at the the scripture reference and read through that on your own as a, a little domestic church devotional if you choose to. However you want to use it, I'm simply going to give you the highlights of what would have been shared on December 27th. So if you hang in with us, thank you, and we will get started. Over the past few weeks, Jason has preached on these different songs, all right, the lyrics of Christmas. And the first week it was Mary's song, then it was Zechariah's song, those are from Luke chapter 1. Then it was the angel song in Luke 2. And <clears throat> today I'll be closing out the series with Simeon's song. So you can hit pause and you can pull out a Bible if you would like to and, and turn with me to the passage we'll be looking at. I won't read it on the video, but you can turn there. It'll be Luke chapter 2, 22 through 35. Song lyrics are powerful, aren't they? Uh, I think... I could probably strike a chord with just about anyone out there who's watching right now just with a few song lyrics. Think back over the years, you know, the songs that you might have grown up with when you were in middle school, high school, college, different points in your life. Song lyrics are powerful and they move us, don't they? I, I thought about two different ways that lyrics to songs can move us. One was physically. Uh, I trust that some of you uh, even if you are a good Baptist, you have danced to music in the past. Uh, so sometimes we dance. Sometimes uh, we, we tap the steering wheel, we tap our foot. Uh, sometimes we, we bob our head, right, when we're driving down the road and hear a, a song that we enjoy. And we sing along with those lyrics that have become familiar to us. But songs 
and their lyrics also move us spiritually and emotionally. Uh, Today we'll consider those lyrics of Simeon's song and give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to move us with those lyrics. As I said, uh, we're in Luke chapter 2, 22 through 35. Now, I have to admit that that's a story, that's a passage that I've read many times, but I've never dug into it. I never really understood the significance, so I have enjoyed the opportunity to study a little bit more closely and draw out some takeaways for us today. Part of my reason for glancing over that passage in the past is that we're no longer bound by Mosaic law. But even though issues of temple worship and sacrifice are no longer with us, they're no, not of any concern to us, they do have value in revealing how God followers responded to the responsibilities that they had at the time that they lived. So, while we don't need to be concerned with keeping the law of Moses, our Heavenly Father has given us responsibilities as His children. Certain practices may long, no, no longer be with us, but the attitudes demonstrated by the actors in this story can still be instructive. So, as we look back to uh, verses 22 through 24, I want to look at what we can glean from the example of Mary and Joseph. Now, this is most likely about 40 days after Jesus has been born, and Mary and Joseph are simply doing what devout Jews of the day did. They're dedicating their firstborn to the Lord and offering the sacrifices that were required in the law of Moses. Now, typically that would have been a lamb, but if you were poor, the law did provide a means by which you could give an offering that was not as expensive as a lamb. Uh, and that's what Mary and Joseph did. They, uh, in the passage, you'll read that they gave uh, two pigeons or two turtle doves. Now, this tells us something about Joseph and Mary. They were poor, but their economic status did not keep them from doing what was required under the law. <clears throat> they, were about, they were devout. They were obedient to the law. And from the time Jesus was born, okay, from the very beginning, they understood their responsibility to strengthen their domestic church. Now, they might have also been familiar with Deuteronomy chapter 6 um, that said, when you lay down, when you get up, when you're at home, when you're out on the road and going about uh, your daily business to be, uh, to be sharing your faith, to be uh, studying the scriptures, sharing the scriptures, okay? All those domestic church things that we say that come from Deuteronomy 6, here's Mary and Joseph doing it uh, with Jesus. Well, then we want to look and we want to observe something about Simeon as well as we look at this passage. First of all, the scriptures tell us he was righteous and devout. He would have been familiar with Old Testament prophecies that talked about the future coming of a Messiah. And he must have been excited about that. And like all the rest of Israel, he's expecting some deliverer, some savior of Israel in the future. And so the Holy Spirit has revealed to him that he is going to have the opportunity to meet and to see this Messiah. He lives with that hope. He'll see the Messiah, the one who will deliver Israel. The Holy Spirit was on him and spoke to him and had revealed things to him in the past and led him into the temple on that day. So as we think about Mary, Joseph, and Simeon, we need to keep in mind that no matter your age, because Mary and Joseph, young couple, right? Simeon, most likely um, a a man who's well advanced in years. Uh, Jason mentioned at the Christmas Eve service, probably over 100 years old. So uh, we've got two very uh, polar opposites here as far as age is concerned. In verses 29 through 32, we see Simeon's song. The first thing we notice is that Simeon acknowledged God as a sovereign Lord. He acknowledged God's power, God's authority, God's control over everything, including Simeon's own life. What struck me were the several you pronouns in those verses. Uh, To me, they indicate that God was taking a lot of initiative in this story. And we know that God is always at work. If you've been through the study of experiencing God um, or are familiar with John 5, 17, where Jesus himself said, my father is always working and so am I. 
God is always at work around us. And, and I think we hear all those you pronouns in uh, Simeon's song, 29 through 32, uh, and we, we can see that that is true. First of all, he, he recognized himself as your servant. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. We see God taking a lot of initiative in that passage. And then immediately Simeon acknowledges God's initiative in seeing Jesus. He doesn't chalk it up to coincidence. The first thing he said, right, was sovereign Lord, and then all these reasons why he sees God taking the initiative here. Not, wow, uh, I, I happen to show up at the temple today, as I normally do, and, and this couple with this child just happened to be there. He recognized God at work from the very beginning. It's a good reason for us uh, to be faithful uh, just with our, our spiritual disciplines. And we're all at different stages on that journey, but uh, through prayer, through the study and the reading of Scripture or devotional materials. By doing that, to a, a, a greater degree, will make you more aware of the Holy Spirit at work around you and then perhaps help you look at things a little bit differently with, with a different perspective, perhaps with an eternal perspective. Now that eternal perspective, that's what Paul described well when he said, fix your eyes on what is unseen. Not on what is seen, for what is unseen is eternal, but what is seen is temporary. He said in in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, set your hearts and your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And then you're probably familiar with James 4, 14, where he said, You don't know what will happen tomorrow. He referred to your life as a vapor that appears for just a little while and then it vanishes away. So an eternal perspective simply acknowledges that in the scope of eternity, whatever is going on in this life now is ultimately of very little consequence. And it was Simeon who had that kind of eternal perspective. And it was that eternal perspective that allowed him to so confidently say, in my New Living Translation, it says that uh, what Simeon said to God was, now you may let your servant die in peace. Other translations say different things. Maybe it's depart in peace or dismiss your servant in peace. They all mean that here's Simeon very content to leave this earth and to leave this life behind. And it was that eternal perspective that we see throughout Scripture that allowed other Uh, other people in Scripture to so confidently face death. You remember uh, Queen Esther in in the book of Esther who uh, was going to petition the king and and that could have resulted in her death, but she said, it doesn't matter. Even if death is in my future, I'm going to go represent my people to the king. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, before they were thrown into the the fiery furnace, uh, told uh, Nebuchadnezzar, even if Uh, you throw us in that furnace, our God can save us. But if he doesn't save us, we're still not bowing down to that idol. Uh, And then Paul in the New Testament, uh, who said to his his disciples, he said, "Um, I I could stay here and I could uh, continue to help you go further in your faith, but it would be better for me if I was to just go be with the Lord. See, he understood and, and desired to be with the Lord versus staying here in this life. And, and all these uh, people in Scripture could do that because of an eternal perspective uh, and being confident about where they're headed uh, after this life. Well, another thing we look at and, and, and that I glean from uh, this story is that no matter your age, God can and will use you to accomplish His purposes. And He just might partner young and old to do it. <clears throat> I'm convinced that at BHBC, Our future will include young and old partnering together and carrying out ministry together. That's you've heard Jason say that since day one uh, when he was here at Bacon Heights back in back in April. Uh, It's important for him, and that's important for Bacon Heights as we move forward. And I think the story of Mary and Joseph and Simeon drives that home. Let me take a little drink. I want to step back and look at this story, okay? Let's just take a step back and look at what's going on here. First of all, without putting any names to it, we've got a young couple who's devoted to the Lord 
and obedient to his leadership. We have a senior adult who is devoted to the Lord and obedient to his leadership. And then God orchestrates this meeting between these three, or four, because of course Jesus is there, he's just been born. God orchestrates this meeting where glory is brought to God and a strong witness is provided for Jesus' identity. Doesn't it seem possible for that pattern to work today at Bacon Heights? I believe that it does. I believe we could experience something similar at Bacon Heights to what Mary, Joseph, and Simeon experienced in that story. To put that in the language of Bacon Heights, they were all on separate treks to the summit. Okay, they're all on different faith journeys. And then those trails intersected. And the result of that intersection of obedient lives brought great glory to God as the Messiah was introduced to the world and God's kingdom was prepared to advance. Now, we're all on different journeys to the summit, all, all of us here at Bacon Heights, but we're all pulling in the same direction. Okay, we're all getting on the same page, and, and I hope you'll be a part of Bacon Heights in January, and especially January 31st, when Jason will unroll and unpack more of what the summit means and what it might mean for you. Uh, but I trust that in the days ahead, and it, it, the days ahead, and it will be sooner <clears throat> rather than later, the faith journeys of many of our members will intersect. We're going to climb the summit together, and the result will be great glory for God, and our kingdom, His kingdom will be advanced in our community. So, just a few takeaways, uh, and maybe you might consider some action steps as we move forward. But first is that eternal perspective produces contentment. Here's Simeon with an eternal perspective. He's looking at all of life uh, through the lens of eternity. And once he sees this Messiah, he's very content to say, Lord, I I'm ready to go home. Uh, dismiss your servant in peace. Uh, I, I could die and, and be happy now because I've seen your salvation. Second thing is that God is always at work around you. He's orchestrating events. He's using people to advance His kingdom. We talk about oikos at Bacon Heights. And I'll take this opportunity to share that today. You've got people around you that you have an influence with. That's your oikos. God wants to use you to influence them, to love them, to be a witness for Christ. You were placed there supernaturally and strategically for that purpose. So latch on to that purpose, that eternal purpose for why you're surrounded by the people you're surrounded by, and be faithful to, to love them, to, to show Christ to them. And then the last thing, intergenerational, intergenerational relationships are very powerful. I believe that intergenerational relationships will be a very unique part of the DNA of Bacon Heights Baptist Church in the near future. <coughs> So, earlier I talked about song lyrics move us. So are you moved today? Maybe as you study uh, the, the, the lyrics of this song in uh, Simeon's song, maybe they move you today in, in a way that they have not before. So what's your response? Some of you watching might be in a place where you know. Now, now you're convinced. You've heard enough about Jesus and who He is and what He did. You believe it. You're ready to admit that you are a sinner and you need a Savior. To believe that Jesus is that Savior. He's the only one who can save you from your sin. And you're ready to choose for yourself to give your life to Him. To, to choose to be reborn, to be a new creation. And you can do that right now in the comfort of your home. But if you do that, or you want to talk more about that, Call to the church office. My name is Mike Lewis. I'd love to talk with you more about that, about that decision, or about making that decision, and help you take appropriate next steps. You might be a believer who's ready to make a deeper commitment to Christ. Whatever that looks like for you, I would encourage you to do it. If you even feel that conviction, that's the Holy Spirit uh, convicting you and moving you. So I would encourage you to take that next step, no matter what it is. Or maybe you're someone looking for a church home. Maybe you're new to Lubbock, or you just know that it's time to make a change uh, in your church involvement, uh, and you want to make BHBC your church home or, or get more information about that. Well, next week when the snow has melted off and we've all 
come out of our homes and uh, we can get out again, come see us next Sunday and uh, we'd love to see you. We'd love to talk with you about taking the next step <clears throat> in the membership process. Well, I'm simply going to close with uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, we are in the midst of 40 days of prayer. Uh, Pastor Ashley, Pastor Jason has uh, encouraged us to be a part of a 40 day of prayer uh, emphasis. I think all the printed copies have been taken, but you can get that on our website. Just go to baconheights.com. It's on the rotator. So click through there and you'll see 40 day summit prayer guide. Again, you can give your end of year contributions online, <clears throat> go to the website, look at the resources tab and choose give online or bring that to our office or have it postmarked by December 31st. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we look forward to seeing you next week.